Hi, welcome to the session on CMA part two, strategic financial management. In this session, we'll discuss about the market analysis, which is also known as the investment analysis. This analysis is conducted from the investor's point of view so that they can make decisions on their investment. Market analysis is, is uh, conducted using the information from the income statement and balance sheet. In a market analysis, we use the market ratios like EPS, how EPS get diluted, diluted earning per share, what is the income that is available to the common shareholders and uh, the book value of each share or common share, price earning ratio, dividend per share, and what is the amount of dividend that is paid from EPS, a dividend payout ratio explains the relationship between the EPS and DPS. So it tells us that what portion of EPS is paid as dividend. A percentage of DPS expressed on EPS. Then the earnings per share we express in terms of the current market price per share that an investor or existing investor may check what is the amount of profit earned per share by this company in terms of the market price per share and what amount of dividend paid by this company in terms of the market price per share currently trading at. So we use these market ratios to find the, the efficiency and the payment and the value of each share. Okay. Um, and especially these ratios belong to only the common shareholders. So we need to keep in mind that using this information, how the common shareholders make decisions entire market ratios are used by the common shareholders who are the ultimate investors who are the ultimate owners of the company so now we are looking at the common shareholders point of view let's begin with a ratio called eps earning per share Earning per share, as the name says, it is the earning in terms of each common share. So when we uh, find net income from the income statement, this is the amount that is, you know, um, attributed to the shareholders but we have two types of shareholders preference shareholders and the common shareholders so we have to give preference a priority to the preference shareholders right first we pay dividend to the preference shareholders dividend to preference shareholders then the rest yes this amount belongs to the common shareholders. Now, this amount is expressed in terms of the number of common shares what we have to arrive at earning per share. Say for example, we have a net income of $50,000 and we paid a 10,000 dividend to the preference shareholders 
So the amount available to common shareholders is 40,000. We call it as what? Income that is available to the common shareholders, IACS. And say, for example, we have 10,000 common shares. So each share is earning a profit of $4. We call it as earning per share. So by default, this EPS belongs to the common shareholders. Because the, the obligation that is due to the preference shareholders has been already paid off. So the rest is common shareholders fund, common shareholders profit, income available to common shareholders. So let us discuss in detail about EPS from our financial statement. It tells us the EPS tells us the income earned by a company per share per share so eps is used in a stock valuation now assume that uh, we have some preference shares to whom we pay a dividend of 16000 on their capital or 200000 dollars at the rate of 8% from the income statement you have 129000 Give priority to the prof preference shareholders. Yes, we paid $16,000 of dividend to the preference shareholders. The rest belongs to common shareholders. This is the income available to common shareholders. And we have $400,000 of share capital. whose share price is $5. So the total number of common shares what we have in the company is 80,000. 80,000 shares have rights on this $113,000 of profit. So what is the profit? What is the income per share? 113 upon 80 gives us $1.41. So the EPS is $1.41. What way it is useful? A shareholder having say 50 shares upon getting this EPS information can understand that my investment owned a profit of $70.5. I have 50 shares and the company declared an EPS of $1.41. So my income owned on this 50 shares this year is $70.5. So I can expect a part of this amount in my bank account as dividend, not entire amount some percentage of this amount mostly the companies pay around 30 to 40 percent of the eps so some percentage of eps is paid as dividend so you can expect some portion of this 70.5 dollars in your bank account as dividend upon its declaration so this is the use of eps not only this you can even see the performance of EPS over time period. Say for example, before uh, last year, the EPS owned by this company was say for example, $1.2. Okay, and now it is $1.41. Uh, before two, you know, two years back, the EPS was 90 cents. For four years back, it was 65 cents. Got it. See, over a period of four years, EPS is gradually increasing from 65.65 to 0.9 to 1.2 to 1.41. So the company's, company's earnings are increasing.
his earnings are increasing year by year. So we can see the performance of the company for a period of four years by comparing EPS each year. So you have year one, year two, year three, and year four. So you may take a decision to hold this investment expecting a good amount of return in the coming year. This builds the confidence in the existing shareholders to hold the investment. So when profit is increasing, EPS is also increasing. It has a positive correlation. As the profits increase, EPS will also increase. So we have a direct relationship between the EPS and net profit of the company. Diluted earning per share, DEPS. Very important, uh, you know, mostly the multiple choice questions. Before we discuss about uh, diluted earning per share, let me give an example. Like you and your friend started a business, earned a profit of $20,000 for a particular year, and you and your friend agreed to share the profits equally. See, now the profit per share is 10,000. So you get 10,000, your friend will get 10,000, right? So this 20,000 is shared by two of you, both of you, yeah? But two of, you know, two more friends joined your partnership firm and saying that we want to be with you guys. So let us share the profits equally. Hmm? So you both and new two friends join this company, sharing the profits equally. So each of you will get, each of you will get $5,000. Your profit got diluted. If there were only two partners, yes, you used to get $10,000. Now, when the partners, number of partners increased, the profit per share per partner got, you know, got diluted. Likewise, in the company also, in a corporate, when the number of shares increase, okay, your EPS will decrease. EPS decreases, therefore we call it as DEPS, diluted earning per share. When number of shares increases, EPS decreases, dilutes, and we call it as what? Diluted earning per share. Now the question is, we have existing shareholders and we have some new shareholders. Now, in the year when you issue shares, you need to give information about this EPS to both existing and new shareholders, right? Okay, say for example, in year two, in year one, you had 10,000 shares. In year two, you issued 5,000 shares, okay, now it increased from 10,000 to 15,000. So the existing shareholder will think that the net profit is going to be divided by 10,000 shares. Yeah, but what happened during second year? Oh, 5,000 new shares were issued, right? So the new shareholders, we need to provide this information that the net profit divided by 15,000 shares. It does, it gives it, you know, a kind of uh, wrong information, right? So what we do is, dear all, dear all, okay, the same net profit divided by 10,000 
as if no new shares are issued we give you a basic earning per share okay just for information both to, to, to both the existing shareholders and new shareholders we give an information that if shares had been not issued with the 10,000 shares how much it should have been with 15,000 shares how much is it okay now let us fill this amount our net profit this year is say $30,000 okay so the EPS should have been what $3 hmm? but this net profit because you have some new shares issued in this year therefore this 30,000 divided by 15,000 will give you what mm, $2 got diluted so basic earning per share as if no shares are issued is $3 and diluted earning per share because of this new shares is $2 let us give this two you know both the information on the income statement face of the income statements debts and debts in year two in year two in year three next year straight away 15,000 because existing and new shareholders know that they have 15,000 shares in the company only only in year two you need to provide the information on BEPS and debts now the question is when we have 10,000 shares in year two we additionally issued 5,000 shares therefore this 10,000 shares have become 15,000 shares now whether this 5000 shares are issued to new shareholders for cash or any preference shareholders are converted back into common shareholders common shareholders okay any debenture holders or bond holders of our company converted back into common shareholders yeah any stock options are given to these employees, warranties or warrants are given, okay, or we just sold for cash. So we need to remember how to calculate on prorata basis, prorata basis when the shares are issued during the year. Like year two, we showed some shares on say April 1st. We issued some shares on say July 1st, November 1st. See the different dates we sold the shares. Or are they are they covered? Are they covered? Are they covering the entire year? No, right? No. So they are not eligible for full year. No. So we need to calculate on prorata basis. Now the question comes who, which shares are to be calculated on prorata basis i'll take you to an example first then we'll use the formula like say for example we have shares from 2007 onwards 20000 shares these are all existing shares so we have some new shares in this year okay no we have 40,000 shares existing and this year we have these transactions sorry so 40,000 shares we have from the beginning okay and these are the transactions that took place in the current year on April 1st we sold 20,000 shares for cash on July 1st we sold 40,000 shares but not for cash we gave these shares to the existing shareholders as top dividend these shareholders these 40000 shareholders are having retained earnings in the company okay and uh, therefore we are now giving this stock dividend okay so 40000 shares whether we should use prorata or not 
Then August 1st, we issued 50,000 shares, but not for cash. The preference shares are converted into common shares. So in this year, we will tell them, dear preference shareholders, you will not get any fixed dividend. So no more fixed dividend. You'll be treated like same common shareholders. Okay. Likewise, on November 1st, we issued 30,000 shares but we issued to bondholders. We tell them that we used to pay 6% interest, right? So don't expect 6% interest this year onwards because you are a common shareholder. Whatever common shareholder is going to get, you will be getting the same. So simple thing to remember is any kind of transactions like this, stock dividend, preference shares are converted into common shares, bonds are converted into common shares, we will not use prorata. Prorata. Take full amount. Why? Because stock dividend, the shares are issued from retained earnings, which are the profits of the common shareholders for long years in the prior years. Preference shareholders, we are not paying any preference dividend this year. So obviously they are eligible for full year. Bondholders, we are not paying interest anything this year. Therefore, they're eligible for full year. And only for the shares which are issued for cash. Yes, you need to use pro rate up based on the time period based on the time period okay calculate the number of months until december and reduce this 20000 shares using the pro rata only for cash okay issued for cash use pro rata so when you calculate converting all these shares into total number of shares eligible for EPS, we call it as weighted average number of shares outstanding. Okay. And this is going to be the denominator in our DEPS calculations. So this is going to be the denominator in our DEPS calculation, diluted earning per share. Then what is net income, adjusted income? Yes, we'll discuss in detail about that as well. So let us calculate the weighted average number of common shares. Existing shares, beginning shares, 40,000, remain 40,000. Shares issued for cash. This is the only transaction we use pro rata basis. As these shares are issued on April 1st, so from April 1st to December 31st, we need to calculate for nine months. So we issued 20,000 shares, but we will consider only 15,000 shares calculating pro rata to, to calculate EPS. Next year, of course, this 20,000 shares are eligible, only this year. Stock dividend, no pro rata because shareholders retain earnings are used to give new shares at free of cost so there is no question of pro rata because they are not sold for cash preference shares and bonds we are not paying any interest and dividend to them they will be treated same like common shareholders irrespective of the date of the issue we do not calculate pro rata we just consider for full year. So 175,000. Okay. This is the denominator. Now, adjusted net income, numerator. Now, these bondholders to whom we used to pay interest are becoming common shareholders. So there will be no interest expense, right? So we'll pay them dividend. When their bonds were there, we deducted interest of 20,000 
arrived at 215,000 EBT and we paid tax on EBT. When there is no bond capital in the company, there is no interest. There is no interest, therefore this will be 235,000, right? So 235,000 times 40% tax is going to be higher, not 86,000. It is more than that. So 235,000 times 40% is 94,000. See, you have an extra tax of $8,000. You know what is $8,000? The 20,000 interest what you're paying times 40% tax you are paying extra because you don't have any interest expense to deduct. So 8,000 is going towards tax. Effectively, your profit will increase by only $12,000. Okay, so your 129,000 is going to be 141,000 when bonds are converted back into common share. So let us adjust the net income this way. So net income plus interest times one minus tax rate will give you adjusted net income. This 20,000 interest you are not paying, therefore you should add it back to 129,000 and your adjusted net income is going to be 141,000. 141,000 divided by 40,000 or 175,000? No, 40,000. 40,000 were the shares we are having last year. This year we calculated weighted average number of common shares, 175,000. Now it is 0 0.80. You remember our EPS was 1.41. Okay when we do not have the transactions on the issuers, issue of new shares. But now the EPS is diluted to $0.8. So we should give this information to both the existing shareholders and the new shareholders. Okay on the income statement. Dear existing shareholder, EPS is 1.41, but it has been reduced to 1.80 because these people joined. So now this EPS, you just add one letter called B, basic earning per share. So the existing shareholder knows that actually it should have been 1.41, but now it's been reduced to 0 0.80 because of the new shares issued for the expansion of the business. In this year, you should show both. Next year onwards, again, you will have only EPS. Okay, so in the year on year of issuance of new shares, we need to present both basic earning per share and diluted earning per share. We understand about the importance of EPS and DEPS, BEPS and DEPS also. Price earning ratio, very important ratio. Uh, it has two meanings because of the perception of the investor. Depends upon the role you play. Like say for example, you are an existing shareholder or a new shareholder. A new shareholder who bought the share at the rate of $10 Okay, uh, an existing shareholder bought this share at uh, ten dollars years ago, and a new shareholder is buying, say, for example, today with a market price at eighty-five dollars. So these two shareholders will think about what is the earning of this company. Okay, just let us understand background of price earning ratio before we discuss about the formula and all. Yeah. Now, existing shareholder, like say for example, 10 years back, he invested in this company by paying $10. Hmm? And if you want to buy 
any new shareholder wants to buy the shareholder the shares of this company any investor wants to buy the shares of this company he has to invest 85 dollars to get the one share okay now they're looking at what is the price of this you know eps what is the profit of this company per share assume that it is two dollars now the existing shareholder He says that my investment is $10. On this, I am getting $2. Perfect. Very good investment. I am getting 20%. 20% return on my investment. But a new shareholder who wished to, a new investor who is wish to buy these shares will see that I am getting $2 if I invest. $85 because it is at the market price right this is a market price and this is the $10 is a par value face value so he thinks that is it worth getting $2 on $85 okay and this is explained by price earning ratio how many times of this profit he has to invest to buy this share how many times of this profit he has to invest to buy this share okay whereas for this person he invested already he says that i got 20 percent return on my investment but this person a new investor will think of one thing that how many times of this income i should invest to buy one share okay so it is the perception of the investor we learn from price earning ratio formula mps upon deps mps upon deps okay in my previous example you have uh, 85 dollars right 85 dollars and eps was two dollars so the investor will have to invest 42.5 times of the income income to buy one share now he will think that is it worth or not so if he is uh, optimistic he may think that oh this ten dollars share has become 85 dollars let me buy at 85 dollars it may become 125 dollars he has a good hopes on this that ten dollars has become 85 dollars 85 dollars may become in future 125 dollars let me buy a pessimistic investor may think that $10 has become $85. I think this is the highest. So may go down or may stand here itself. It is not worth investing 42.5 times of income what I'm earning here. So almost it is 42 years to get my investment back. Yeah? Isn't it? 42.5 times of income is equivalent to investment. So you may think the other way pessimistic way okay and just add one note here whenever now onwards we use the formula whenever now onwards when we use the formula okay use eps so use dp deps if available if so okay so if you have DEPS in the question, you should use DEPS. Wherever we are using EPS now onwards, if both EPS and DEPS both are available, you should use DEPS, diluted earning per share, because that is the effective ratio. All right, so let us have an example here. Mm, current market price of this share is $120 today from the market we picked up this value and this year the company declared an EPS of $6 okay all right so the new investor will have to invest 20 times of this income to buy one share optimistic very good investment a $10 share has become $120 tomorrow it may become $150 $200, $300. Pessimistic. $10 has already become $120. And 20 years almost 
okay investment i am investing to get my investor amount my amount back so he may think in another way so it depends upon the perception of the investor whether to invest or not but higher the ratio the good is okay the next ratio which is highly tested on your exams is book value per share bvps a best weapon in the hands of existing shareholders to make decisions to hold or to sell a particular investment as we use the word book value it means it is an historical value it is from the balance sheet figures okay so it is extracted from the information what we receive from balance sheet okay and calculate the value of each share common share again each share all right so now here the formula to calculate bvps is common shareholders equity i want to reinstate one or one more point that all the ratios which we are using in this session belong to common shareholders ultimate owners okay so the common shareholders equity upon number of common shares outstanding so common shareholders equity remember super 6 from this super 6 you should take only four points four amounts okay what are they common shareholders capital premium retain earnings minus treasury stock and number of common shares outstanding means the number of shares issued minus any shares bought back a company issued 100000 shares but this year we bought back 500 shares so we have only 99500 shares with the external investors 500 shares are held by company so the outstanding shares are only 99500 we should use only 99500 not treasury stock so the numerator the uh, uh, calculation of shareholders equity include the amount of share capital invested by the common shareholders paid in excess of par paid in excess of par belongs to the common shareholders nothing but the premium paid by the common shareholders to buy the shares plus the retain earnings, retain earnings, which are the appropriations of the prior year profits, minus any treasury stock, dollar amount, which he used to buy the shares back, minus amount. This is a contra. So from the total of these three items, direct treasury stock to hold, to get common shareholders equity. All right. So don't expect treasury stock in each and every question. So I don't have any treasury stock here. So I didn't detect any amount. From our balance sheet, we can see that uh, 400,000 is the common share capital. Paid in excess of par common share capital. The premium is 120,000 and return earnings of 335,000. Gives us 855,000, and you know that we have 80,000 shares. That is a share capital divided by share price. So the BVPS is 10.68. You may ask a question that how do I use BVPS, book value per share? You are an existing shareholder in this company having 100 shares. What is the book value? What is the book value of your investment? So 100 shares times 10.68 will give you $1,068. So as per your recent balance sheet, your investment value is 1.68. Oh, so oh, sorry, $1,068. Now say for example, if I sell these 100 shares, what amount I'm going to get? Hmm? 
now you will see the market price of this share in the currently what is it trading at it is trading at 85 dollars fantastic book value 10.68 okay so the market value is 85 dollars so the value of investment is 8500 dollars see book value is compared with the market value so what what do you understand here bvps is compared with mps market price per share currently being traded bvps is compared with the market price share so your market price per share is 85 dollars and the bvps is 10.68 dollars it is almost seven eight times eight times right almost eight times of your bvps so in simple the ratio should be always greater than one okay what you calculate here the mps upon bvps the ratio should be always greater than one it is simple right mps should be this should be more than this mps should be more than this so obviously the uh, ratio will be greater than one so how many times you're lucky here it is almost eight times you're happy but if the share price is 8.5 dollars okay not 85 dollars 8.5 dollars come on you will be getting 850 dollars but as for the book it is 1068 hmm? okay but you are getting here 850 dollars what is the use of balance sheet figures you are the investor you're not happy with that as per the books it is 1068 but when you want to sell it off it is 85 dollars so it is less than one right so an existing shareholder doesn't like this ratio to be less than one he wants market price per share should be greater than the book value per share okay so a greater than one is always welcomed one more and more not just greater than one but at least it should be greater than one yeah right so this is the reason uh, an investor will calculate market to book ratio which is mps upon bvps okay using the same ratio let us assume that currently your share is traded at 53 dollars 53 upon 10.68 4.96 hey, it's greater than one 4.96 times i have a good investment when i sell it when i sell it i have 100 shares okay 10.68 it is 1068 but i sell this 100 shares at the current market price at the rate of 53 dollars so i'll get 5300 more than the book value more than the book value when you say more than book value when your market to book ratio is greater than one it is greater than one it is 4.96 times more than your book value good shareholder is happy so mps to bvps tells us whether the market price is greater than the book value per share or not supposed to be greater than one now an existing shareholder always checking that my two dollars of eps is very good because i invested ten dollars in this company ten years ago so the par value of the share 10 years back was $10 and the earning per share this year is $2. So the investor is very happy comparing these two amounts. He says that my return on investment is 20%. But somebody advised him that, dear, you invested this share 10 years back, you know, 
you are still comparing with your original investment which you invested 10 years back you know the price in the market now if you look at it is 85 dollars the market price okay just look at this point this two dollars on this 85 dollars is worth or not no 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 i am an already investor i invested at 10 dollars i'm getting two dollars 20 percent boss listen to me okay you are an investor in this company if you sell this share you are getting 85 dollars or not yes yes i will get 85 dollars if you invest any other company the same amount if you invest in any other company or in any bank you are getting say 5% interest per year. So if you invest this $85 with 5% interest, you are getting $4.25. And you are saying that very happy with $2, you are getting 20%. No, you are not getting 20%. You are just comparing 20% on the par value which you invested 10 years back. If you sell the same share today, you will get 85 even if you invest this money in any government bank you will be getting 4.25 you know dollars don't think of this 20 percent even if you think of this five percent you are getting 4.25 dollars oh, okay what is it called this is called earnings yield earnings yield tells us that what is the income that is produced by this company not in the form of you know not in terms of the price at which we buy but in terms of the current market price okay so it is eps upon current market price but what i said whenever deps is available do not use eps you should use diluted earning per share okay so it is deps upon current market price mps so in simple we can say that it is inverse of price earning ratio when you calculate the ups and down, then it will become what? Uh, earnings yield. See, MPS upon DEPS give us what? Price earning ratio. If you just inverse it or reverse it, uh, numerator and denominator, then it becomes what? Earnings yield. Okay. We have a diluted earning per share of, assume that it is $2.3, current market price is $120, now it is 1.92%. If an existing shareholder is still thinking about is $10 of investment, it is 23% return on investment, but it is 1.92% as per the current market price. So there's a big variation, right? So if you're still thinking of your historical investment, it is 23%, which is wrong, in fact. But you to sell it off at $120 because it's not giving you when you express in terms of $120. Okay. Then the next uh, ratio, what we discuss about is dividend yield. What is dividend yield? What is earnings yield? In my previous example, you are using $2.3 of earning per share, right? But this entire amount is not going to hit your bank account. No way. So some portion will be paid as dividend per share. The remaining portion will be reinvested in the business as retained earnings. So what is the dividend income which you are earning in your bank account in terms of the market price? That is important. So some shareholders, they look at dividend much, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, closer than earnings because earnings are retained in the business, right? But dividend is hitting my bank account. So let me calculate using only dividend, which is the cash which I'm getting. So it is in their terms, it is a cash return. It is a cash return. How much actually received by a shareholder for each stock each share all right sir eps is a eps part of eps is already retained in the business what do i do with that how much is going into my bank account that is to be shown in dividends yield so dividend yield upon current market price per share so i'm not going to consider 2.3 i'm going to consider only 
what amount I received. See, in the previous example, when we calculate earnings yield, we used entire profit of the company in terms of each share. But now what I say is this amount is not going to hit my bank account. What I received should be considered. Yes, dividend per share upon current market price. So your cash return is 0.77%. Cash return, the amount of cash that hit on your in your bank account based on your current market price. This is simply uh, you know a dividend payout ratio simply tells us that what amount of dividend you received out of EPS. Let me give a small example here. A company paid a dividend which is different from EPS. Now let us take an example of EPS and BPS. Company earned a profit of two dollars per share. We call it as what EPS. And the company passed a resolution that 40% of the profit is uh, distributed as dividend and remaining 60% is retained in the business. So this will go into what retained earnings. Clear. Now we want to know the relationship between DPS and EPS. So we are going to get a, we are going to get the same result, okay? But we just study the relationship between DPS and EPS in dividend payout ratio, okay? Now let us see dividend payout ratio. You will get 10 per 40 percent, same 40 percent. Let's see here. It tells us that the earnings, a portion of earnings that are paid to the shareholders, all right? So dividend payout ratio is DPS upon EPS. DPS upon it is not DPS, please. DPS is diluted earning per share. It is DPS, dividend per share upon BPS. BPS, basic earning per share. How much amount is paid? 40%. See the same result. 2.3 times 40%. You can see here 2.3 times 40% is paid as dividend and 60% is retained in the business. So when you see the relationship between EPS and DPS, it is again 40%. Dividend yield tells us that, or so dividend payout ratio tells us what amount of or what percentage of EPS is paid as dividend. Now the shareholders will ask a question that why are we investing back or flowing back the profits into the business why don't you pay this amount as dividend we want entire 2.3 dollars as dividend okay so paid dividend so that eps dps will remain same there are some legal restrictions that entire profit is not to be distributed to the shareholders because we borrowed money from banks, we issued some bonds, debentures, we have employees, we have suppliers. So if any, uh, you know, thing, uncertainty that takes place, you need to have some reserves in the company to sustain in the business, right? So for this, we need to give a confidence uh, to the existing shareholders that, dear shareholders, do not sweep up the profits Keep some amount in the business. We will assure you some growth on that. Okay, so that please flow back your profits into the business. We show some growth on that. Okay, so you need to have an indicator to show them that how the profits which are flowed back are helping to grow the business helping to grow the return on equity, common shareholders equity. Okay, so we find the sustainable growth ratio on the amount reinvested. Okay, so here 
from 2.3 dollars assume that 40 percent is paid as dividend and the remaining 60 percent is retained in the business you are responsible that how this is going to improve the return on equity because the profits are flowed back so when i'm giving you this amount you show me growth in my equity so roe return on equity multiplied by the 60 percent okay 60 percent so whatever the return on equity i have say for example 12 percent is the return on equity times 60 percent you should show me growth in my return on earnings return on equity that much growth should be there so gave me some sustainable growth rate existing return on equity is 15 percent okay you're asking me to okay sustain uh, uh, you know you're asking me to retain some 60 percent of the profit you are paying only 40 percent dividend so i'm retaining one minus 40 percent that is going to be there in the business so you'll have to give me a growth rate of nine percent i'm happy for that but don't ask me without showing any growth rate okay we are using uh, market analysis which is used by the investors to make decisions we also use you know the performance of the business based on not just only the sales but also the assets how best the assets are used how best the investors money is used with an analysis called dupont analysis in which we use three components profit margin asset turnover and the leverage a profit margin what we learned in a profitability ratios net income upon net sales asset turnover we learned in a turnover ratios net sales upon the average total assets and the financial leverage the total assets and total equity how much of equity used to acquire the assets if you just you know use some mathematics here net sales and net sales will get cancelled assets and assets will get cancelled net income upon equity is nothing but return on equity but we have some indicators here whether we have the right indicators or not okay so when we calculate the product of these three components you get return on equity so is there any possibility to improve this component one of the components out of these three we need to analyze so here can you see two companies profit margin sally is doing well asset turnover okay sales upon total assets every hundred dollars of assets will help us to make a sale of 50 but joe six six it is six times okay capital structure we have assets owned by the owners funds three here it is only 0.5 so we can get this kind of information from dupont analysis though we use uh, the ratios for different purposes still we can find some limitations of ratio analysis uh, the limitations include the methods used by different companies okay so when we want to compare our ratios with the competitors ratios their policies can be different from our policies their methods can be different from other our methods be it uh, depreciation be it uh, inventory stock flow methods like fifo lifo etc it can be like you know uh, the uh, method like completed contract method or percentage completion method in the case of long-term construction contracts and ratios are just based on historical figures future is different they are not adjusted as per the current market conditions like inflation etc and the ratios are just highlighting only the past results the future we have so many uncertainties just they are used as a base but doesn't mean that we are going to achieve 
what we plan. There are some limitations. And the reliability is the way. Because some companies, they inject some fictitious information to the system. So we cannot say that uh, the ratios are correct. And the ratios are only just indicators. Okay. So they do not just provide the information on the financial position or for performance of the business independently. Okay. Sometimes the company may really do well but the ratios are not so good. Okay, there are the limitations. All right, so we discussed about EPS, diluted earning per share, ISES, book value per share, price earning share, dividend per share, dividend paid from earnings per share, earnings yield, dividend yield. We also discussed about DuPont analysis and few limita or limitations of ratio analysis. This is the end of the session on market analysis for owners funds who make decisions based on the ratios. We'll see you in the next session. Till then, have a good time. Are you a finance professional or an accounting student but not so sure of your career options? How about CPA, CMA, CFA certifications? You'll be intrigued to know that the big four and multinational companies pay a handsome salary package to fresher with CPA, CMA, CFA certifications, and of course that's just the starting point. Let's Learn Global brings you biggest video lecture collection with 100 plus hours of video courses. CPA, CMA, CFA, video lectures, and notes which are perfect supplement to your certification journey. Certification Video Lectures is a series of video lectures to completely understand major certification from beginner to advanced level. The course is designed with the purpose of learning popular certifications in a series of video lectures. It contains a list of all popular certifications that are essential for a better future and career growth. By learning these popular video lectures one can easily clear certification exams, which provide skills that are highly demandable in the market. Sharpen your skills with our Academy app and you will get free courses on CPA, CMA, CFA. To get our course, download Class Plus app. Android users can download our app from Google Play Store. iOS users can download our app from Apple App Store and use our organization code Enrich to get our free courses. The course contains highly interactive video lectures with best in the industry features some are listed below. Comprehensive videos. 50 plus video lectures per subject. Practice exams. Desktop, laptop, mobile and tab friendly. Instructor support. Access anywhere. HD video lessons. No more long and boring video classes. Our lectures are crisp, precise and to the point. Hurry, download our app today and get recognized globally with Let's Learn Global. For any assistance you can WhatsApp or call at 0091 800